Good afternoon. We will be starting in just a minute. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the webinar today to discuss ethics in action. The Code of Ethics is a detailed document that spells out the professional responsibilities of every realtor. And because of that, we have an obligation to become familiar with the Code of Ethics and all of the ways in which we can follow what it details and spells out. We have to remember that the Code of Ethics was the foundation of the licensing laws that we now have to follow in order to keep our license. So it's a matter of two responsibilities, the obligations we have based on our license, as well as our obligations to act in an ethical manner. So what does this mean to you? It means that any realtor with whom you work has voluntarily agreed to follow and to abide by the Code of Ethics based on professionalism and mainly protection of the public. Realtors are subject to disciplinary action and sanctions if any violations of the duties um, are imposed by the Code of Ethics. So today we're going to talk about Article 2 of the Code of Ethics. Last week we had the preamble in Article 1. Today we're going to discuss Article 2 of the Code of Ethics, which clearly states that realtors shall avoid exaggeration, misrepresentation, or concealment of pertinent facts relating to the property or the transaction. Realtors shall not, however, be obligated to discover latent defects. Latent defects are hidden defects that cannot be visually seen, that cannot be seen things that are covered, okay, in the property to advise on matters outside the scope of the real estate license such as engineering issues, zoning issues, things that have to do with the survey, anything that has to do with a professional, like a, a plumbing issue or electrical things, or to disclose facts which are confidential under the scope of agency or non-agency relationships as defined by state law. So with that in mind, I want to go over the different standards of practice under Article 2. Standard of Practice 2-1, again, standards of practice amplify and explain how the article may be violated. So realtors shall only be obligated to discover and disclose adverse factors reasonably apparent to someone with expertise in those areas required by the real estate licensing authority. Article two does not imp impose upon the realtor the obligation of expertise in other professional or technical disciplines. So basically what that means is that we cannot be expected to be experts in engineering, in plumbing, in um, soil, in any of the aspects of the house that require a different person in their knowledge and expertise. However, we are only required to um, discover and disclose any adverse factors that are apparent. Now, several years ago, 
a seller's property disclosure statement was created. And this came about because specifically in the state of New Jersey, um, the there's a law that states that sellers when selling property are required to disclose any known defects in the property. What has happened in the past is that real estate agents would take information provided by the seller verbally, put it down, and then disclose that information in the form of the MLS printout or in a flyer. The buyer would then take that information and assume it was correct when the buyers would find out that the information was not correct they would come back and sue real estate agents and brokers for misrepresentation of information about the property this was going on so much that the new jersey realtors association lobbied with the state and with the department of um consumer affairs in New Jersey to allow for the creation of a seller's property disclosure statement that would provide that obligation to the seller, which they were already required to provide information about the property. But now with the seller disclosure statement, they would include in writing all of the details they knew about the property. It very specifically states in the seller's property disclosure statement that the information is provided by the seller, that it came from the seller, that the real estate agent had nothing to do with the information. And we as real estate professionals do not fill out the form. It is the seller's house. They know what they have done to the property they know the defects and the problems it has and it is their information to the best of their knowledge that they are providing we are simply taking that information now it does state in the law that as real estate professionals before we pass that information on to the potential buyer that we will verify that information is correct so part of our obligation is to take a look at the seller's disclosure statement do basically a look around the property and confirm what they have provided now when it comes to the seller saying well i changed the roof five years ago how are we supposed to know if we are not roofers or experts in roofing materials, whether that is a five-year roof or not. The best way to make sure we protect ourselves is to ask the seller to provide receipts of any of the work they have had performed on the house, which they stated in their seller's property disclosure statement. If something as we are walking around the property um, does not match what they have provided, we have an obligation to point it out and say to the seller, this does not match, please provide explanation or correction to the seller's disclosure statement. Okay, and this is where our obligation really um, is very important for us to follow, because if we don't, then a lawsuit could still come back to us. Now, this is about the code of ethics, but there are there's more than just being found guilty of a violation of the code of ethics. There is also our obligation by our license and also by our agency obligations that we have to the buyer or to the seller in case um, to protect them also in case there is a potential lawsuit that could be coming in the future based on information they provided okay so 
when it says realtor shall only be obligated to discover that is where by doing a visual inspection of the property now where i'm not talking about inspection like the inspector does opening up the electrical box or doing anything like we don't have to move furniture or get on top of the roof or anything like that but we do have an obligation to take a look at the property and confirm that the information is correct so what happens when we don't do that is that we are passing on information that if it turns out to be incorrect we could end up with a problem such as in the case of i'm gonna um tell you about um a case interpretation now this pertains per particularly with the um the realtor board where if a buyer or a seller has any issues or finds that information that was provided was incorrect or misrepresentation they can go on to the realtor board and actually uh, make a complaint so in case interpretation 2-1 a realtor was acting as a management agent in other words he was responsible for uh, managing for a seller or for a landlord several properties so he offered a vacant property for rent to a prospective tenant stating that the house was in good condition and this is why it is so important for us to not um, volunteer information that we do not know for sure is correct shortly after the tenant entered into a lease and moved into the house he filed a complaint against the realtor with the Board of Realtors charging misrepresentation because upon moving into the apartment or the house, he had found that a, a clogged sewer line and also a defective heater had been discovered. This information was contrary to the statement that the, the realtor had uh, provided saying that the house was in good condition. At the hearing, um, the, the realtor stated that the house was in good condition based on his visual inspection. That as soon as the tenant reported the clogged sewer line and the defective uh, heater, the realtor on the day after he moved in responded immediately by engaging a plumber and someone to repair the heater real the realtor had no prior knowledge of these defects and he had acted promptly and responsibly to correct the defects and that he had made an honest and sincere effort to render satisfactory service so even though the realtor had acted in good faith and when a problem was presented addressed it and fixed the problem immediately he still found himself defending himself in front of a panel okay because he had proof of what he had done the hearing panel decided that the realtor was not in violation of article 2 of the code of ethics but what if okay in this particular situation and by the way, these case scenarios are real case scenarios that have been um, made available to us for training purposes. But what if the um, it was not a rental? Maybe it was a sale. I'm going to give you an example of a situation where I actually was sued. I did not end up in the Board of Realtors panel or hearing panel, but I, if there was an actual lawsuit. Um, lodged against me and my broker several years ago because the information that i provided to the buyer in a flyer and this is before the seller's property disclosure statement law became you know came into effect they um the seller had said that they had purchased the property when it was brand new and the builder had said 
that it was he was putting up making it ready to put a second bathroom in the second floor by me taking that information putting it in a flyer i basically stated that it was ready for a bathroom on the second floor uh when the buyer went in and uh, moved into the property within six months we received in this case it was not uh, an ethical complaint but it was a specific lawsuit charging misrepresentation of information on the flyer because when they went to home depot to uh, buy a toilet and a sink and uh, a shower they expected the words ready for a bathroom meant that they just needed to buy the things and hook them up that's that was their interpretation of ready for a second bathroom and when they got there to the property and started breaking down the walls they found that clean water lines were installed but there was no sewer lines installed. Therefore, the property was not ready for a second bathroom. Now, if this information had been put in writing by the seller, there was no reason for me to know whether it was correct or not because I was not expected to open up the walls and determine whether that was correct or not. But because it was from me that the information went, we ended up in court, okay? Let me tell you, it was probably one of the most expensive experiences. And because of that, now every time I take a listing, I make it a point to get the seller's property disclosure statement signed by the seller. I take a look at the information and pass it on knowing that if there's a lawsuit ever in the future, it's gonna go it's gonna bypass me and go straight to the seller not to me okay so that's why i wanted to take this very seriously and let you know how uh, you could end up in a problem that buyer could have done both besides the lawsuit where you know, he, he wanted the money but he also could have um took me to the board of realtors with a with a case like you know we had in the case interpretation i read to you before okay so let's talk about um article um standard of practice two in standard of practice uh three actually were moved um they were renumbered and turned into um standard of practice 112 and 113 which we covered last week. So they just, they rearranged them and moved them to another location. Okay. Um, in article, uh, standard of practice two, three, realtors shall not be parties to the naming of a false consideration in any document, unless it be the naming of an obviously nominal consideration in this particular situation i am going to give you an example um um and and this is basically a, a situation where we have an obligation to make sure everyone involved in the transaction is acting in good faith in this particular situation, we are not allowed if somebody is trying to do um, something that would be or could be considered fraud um, or in, in an effort to uh, lie in any situation. Um, when it comes to false consideration in any document, for example, several, several years ago, there were uh, buyers who were trying to you know there's a lot of different people involved i cannot say that it was only the buyers that were doing this they had to be working in conjunction with the real estate agent as well as attorneys that were allowing this to happen but they would have basically two different contracts okay um they would have one contract that stated it which was provided to the bank that would say the 
property is being purchased for, let's say, $200,000, but the real price that was being paid to the seller was maybe $230,000. And they were giving basically false information or consideration. Um, this is considered mortgage fraud. And it is something that we cannot be involved in. Um, I have had um, several times people who asked me if we could maybe make a deal directly with the seller and then get the loan for a different amount. Sometimes it was the other way around, which also caused a lot of problems um, when the lender's guidelines and requirements for borrowers are very lenient. And they would say basically they are buying the property for $300,000 when in reality they were only paying $250,000. And the buyer walked out with a loan for more than they have actually paid for the property. So it's very, very important for us to always make sure that we are working in an ethical manner, that we're following the laws, and that we are not getting ourselves into any um, uh, any hot water by trying to help people who are not being honest in their transaction. In standard of practice 2-5, it says factors defined as non-material by law or regulation or which are expressly referred in law or regulation as not being subject to disclosure are considered not pertinent for purposes of Article 2. And um, this was adopted in January of uh, two, uh, 1993. And what I want to do is I want to give you an example um, of pertinent facts, okay? Um, shortly after Realtor A, who was the listing broker, closed the sale of a home, to the buyer, a complaint was received by the Board of Realtors charging that the realtor had alleged an alleged violation of Article 2 and that he had failed to disclose a substantial fact concerning the property. The charge indicated that the house was not connected to the city's sanitary sewage system, but rather had a septic tank. In a statement that was provided to the agreements committee, uh, the buyer B, the buyer, stated that the subject was not discussed during his various conversations with the realtor about the house. However, he pointed out that his own independent inquiries had revealed that the street on which the house was located was sewered, in parentheses, and he naturally assumed that the house was connected. He had since determined that every other house on the street for several blocks on both directions was connected. And he stated that the realtor, in not having disclosed this exceptional situation, had failed to disclose a pertinent fact. So a pertinent fact is something that somebody could assume reasonably that is important to them. So Realtor A's defense, the Realtor's defense in the hearing before the Professional Standards Committee was that he did not know that the house was not connected with the sewer, that he, in the advertising of the house, he had not represented that it had been connected. He had never mentioned that in any advertising that at no time as buyer B, uh, as the buyer conceded, had he verbally stated that the house was connected and that it was common knowledge that most, if not all of the houses in the area were connected to the sewer and that the seller in response to the realtor's questions at the time of the listing, when he went, had entered into the listing agreement, had stated that the house was connected to the sewer. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, the uh, panel determined that the absence of a sewer connection in the area 
where the houses were connected was a substantial and pertinent fact in the transaction, but that the fact that the house was not connected to the sewer was not possible to be determined in the course of a visual inspection and that real the realtor had made appropriate inquiries of the seller and was entitled to rely on the representations of the seller the panel concluded that this realtor was not in violation of article 2 specifically because he had inquired he had never provided information that would be uh, considered false in that particular situation, okay? Um, now, it, it is very gray, it's a gray area trying to determine what would a third party, what would somebody determine to be important to them or not. And for us, that's very difficult. That's why we always have to be asking questions and going deeper in those questions to determine what is really important to that buyer. Several years ago, I was working with a client who never mentioned, who had mentioned very clearly to me, I do not want to be on a main road. In other words, if the, if the street has a double yellow line, I do not want to live there. And now they made it very, very clear. So I said, okay, any house that was in a, in a major road or a, a busy road, I removed from the list. Um, I went to show them a property. It was very nice. It had everything they were looking for. However, when we went to the property, um, I discovered something that was even more important than, than the yellow double line, uh, which was um, it had, like they fell in love with it. And it was in the it, a little bit evening. So it was a little bit dark in the backyard. Um, so we looked through and there I am thinking, this is an absolute sale. They loved it. It was in really great condition. We had the the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, the basement, the garage, everything was perfect. When we got to the kitchen, there were sliding doors going out to the backyard. So now the husband walks out very enthusiastically. He's in the backyard saying, this is fabulous. The wife was in the kitchen, started trembling and basically saying, I'm not going out there. Is that a cemetery behind the yard? And I said, yes, actually it is. So I kind of made a little joke and said, you have very, very quiet neighbors behind you. So she, um, she was very scared and refused to go outside. The husband did not mind, but the wife said, absolutely, there's no way. Um, I'd rather live on a highway rather than living next to or behind a cemetery. So now I know that this person's um, pertinent information includes the proximity to a cemetery. So now from then on, every time I looked for houses, I was looking for properties that were far away from a cemetery. I actually found another property was perfect for them, but there was a large fence and a big hedge in the backyard Behind that was another cemetery. And even though it matched all of their criteria, I told them, look, this house came up. I know how you feel about the cemetery. I just want to show you. It looks very nice. You don't see the cemetery, but I need you to know that it is behind the property. If I had shown them that property and sold it to them, and later on, she found out that there was a cemetery behind that huge hedge, even though she could not see it. I could have been in violation of Article 2 because um, the situation with the, with the cemetery, the proximity of it, was a pertinent fact that was important to her. Okay? So I wanted to just make sure we cover that. So... 
with this case studies, it's not enough to know what the article says, but also to understand how to follow our clients instructions and try to help them in the best way we can when it comes to the information pertinent to the property. When we are working with the seller, we should always ask for the seller to provide the information which is already required by law um, and also by making sure that it is correct. But also when working with a buyer, we should always try to, um, when, the, when they say they're interested in a property, to actually pull down the seller's property disclosure statement if it is available in the multiple listing service and make that available to the buyer before they make an offer so that they're making an informed decision and an offer based on pertinent facts that might um, this help them decide whether they do want to live in that property or not. So it's very important to practice what we learn and to practice what we know. I really appreciate you being here today, uh, today with me at lunchtime and I hope you have a wonderful day. This has been um, Ethics in Action for Article 2 of the Code of Ethics. Have a wonderful day and see you next week with Article 3.